Hello, good evening, and welcome to PM Express Personality Friday. Tonight, my guest is the former president of Botswana. He's a distinguished African leader, being a neighbor to Zimbabwe. I'm sure you may have heard Robert Mugabe, but have not heard much about Festus Mugai, the former president of Botswana, who was in 2008 awarded the Mo Ibrahim Award for Excellence for his contribution and leadership to the fight against HIV in Botswana. Tonight, we will delve into the man behind the president and what makes him who he is and how he has been able to, to run the affairs of Botswana, which has been acclaimed as one of the success stories of Africa. His Excellency Festus Mugai, it's a privilege to have you here on PM Express Personality Profile. Thank you. Welcome to Ghana. Thank you. How does it feel being a president, an African president? <laughs> That's a difficult question. It feels like you're an African president. Really? Yes. With all the power and all the pecs and all of the, a president. And all the challenges that and you face. And all the challenges. What is expected of you. And your time as president um, has been spoken about as some of the, one of the most successful in leadership in Africa. How did you manage it? Well, I did my best. I analyzed the situation that I faced. I decided to tackle the problems and the challenges that I faced the best I can. I succeeded in some cases and failed in others. You failed in others. Yes. You acknowledge that you failed in others. Yes. Which are the ones you feel you didn't do exactly well and that if you had a second shot at being a president, you would like to do correct, actually? I think I would uh, demand more hard work on the part of our people than, than we did. Because uh, I think, look, it, again, the background of a country that was very, very poor. We discovered minerals and we began to have uh, some, uh, some cash. And we were anxious to fight poverty. And we did a lot of things that were good, but in other words, like for instance, education and training. We prioritized education and training because we said that uh, developing uh, the human resources is the most important thing. And that in any case, someday when the minerals are finished and people ask, what did you do with the money? We would say we spent it empowering the people with education and training. That's one of the things that we did right. But we also tried to create uh, generous, cheap credit schemes for the people and they didn't pay back. So. We allowed a tradition where people don't pay back loans they get from public institutions. And because we never took really any action uh, against them. That's one of the things that we... One of the really, things. Yeah. Now, your, your role in the fight against HIV was tremendous. I mean, Botswana uh, had about 25% of the adult population by the time you assumed office living with HIV. How did that hit you as a president with this burden? How did you feel and how did you start working out It was the, the greatest challenge. I mean, when you become president, there are a number of things that you want to do. I'm an economist. I wanted the development, growth and expansion, education and training, health, provision of clean water, uh, physical infrastructure. Those are the kind of things that one is, is thinking about. Um, and also you make promises that you, about all those, those things that you'd want to do them. But then certain things just happen without consulting you. And in my case, one thing that just came across was AIDS. And I was the number one citizen. And therefore, and AIDS cut across everything that we were trying to do whether it's agriculture, whether it's public health, whether it's education, whether it's physical infrastructure, it cut across everything. 
the AIDS because burden on the, AIDS the burden. productive population was in the a very big place, deal, right? In the first place, the number of people who fell sick and died, our health facilities were overwhelmed. Our health workers suffered burnout because they tell me that normally when you are a medical doctor, for instance, you deal with 10 patients. At worst, you, exp you expect to lose one. Not where you have 10 patients, you lose nine, and only one survives. When, when that is the case, and that was the case we were facing, and so our medical workers, our health providers, both medical doctors and nurses, were facing that situation. Uh, 24 hours, they, they, uh, and the, the physical facilities were overwhelmed. Patients were everywhere uh, on the ground, uh, you know, not to talk of shortage of beds. And so that was really, uh, so that's when I said that when I spoke at the United Nations, that we faced possible extinction because of the death rates that were, were happening. And therefore, we appealed to the international community. We were told there were things called antiretrovirals. They were not known at that time, and, and they, it was an experimental stage. And therefore, we discussed, we took part in debates, the international community, in international councils, about the affordability of antiretrovirals and their efficacy. There were lots of fears that, that uh, uneducated people will not understand the regimen, and therefore we might even create a greater monster than the AIDS virus. Uh, and that we should be careful that the pharmaceutical measures will be using us as guinea pigs. So I took the view that we didn't have much of a choice. Who was going to be a guinea pig for us when we were dying? And so we thought that it was better to die trying and not just lying down and dying. And so, we ne first we told them that the, ph the major pharmaceutical companies, that what they were asking was much, much more than we can ever afford. So we negotiated and ultimately we got a uh, very substantial, dramatic discount, up to 90, 95% discount to acquire those uh, antiretrovirus when we ultimately uh, acquired them. So that's what we did. And so we, therefore, we became the first country uh, in Africa to provide antiretrovirals to all citizens free of charge. And, and so how that's did, what how we did, did the country manage the financial burden of that? I'm sure it didn't come that's, that's absolutely what I'm saying. free for That's what for I'm country. saying, that we, the little resources at our disposal, we diverted from development and other projects to saving lives because there cannot be a greater priority for any national leader than the saving of his uh, citizens' lives. And therefore, all the resources that were at our disposal, we made them available against the treatment against and did, AIDS. Did others and we negotiated with the pharmaceutical companies and we received generous assistance from many of them, including from the, um, the Gates Foundation, Global Fund, Mac Foundation. Well, Global Fund came later. We would have all died before the Global, the Fund, Global came. Fund came. Yes. And, um, and so, yes, we have used the Global Fund, but it was not the major one. And did other areas By the time, of the economy suffer? As a result of, course, of, of the course, prioritization, of course, for example, of course. what was happening to agriculture? Of course, what was happening of course, to education? Of course, all these others. AIDS was killing the very... I told you that education and training was a priority for our people. Education was free. So we were beginning to receive some of the young people who were coming back as graduates. And they, these were the people who were dying. Young policemen. Young doctors, young nurses, young lawyers, young engineers. That, that's how bad it was. Uh, and therefore, obviously, the other sectors were neglected. Not because 
we, we well, we could have done a little more uh, if the people were there, but the people are not there. You couldn't talk about something about a farmer, about uh, his crop. You have to be talking about his life first. That was what was happening. Mm. That was the situation. When we started and I asked you how it feels to be an African president, my mind was on the fact that I haven't been a president before. And standing back, I may see that as a very prestigious life. When you wake up in the morning as a president, what goes on in your mind? Many, many, many things. Whatever happens in the country, you are accountable. At least that is it. Good way. or bad? Good or bad, you are accountable. But if, if, it's bad, if it's good, they don't give a them. People will celebrate. If it's bad, they say, Mr. President, what are you doing about it? If a bridge has collapsed, they say the bridge has collapsed. A bus has killed 20 children. What are you doing about it? If there is a flood, if children fail in a particular year, the results, either standard six or school certificate your, or the university, fault. what are you doing about it? The opposition is saying, we have always said that this, this government is no good, the education system is no good, um, the quality of the teaching is bad. Look how children are, as you know, with parents. When the children pass, it's because they are clever. When they fail, it's because the teachers are bad. And that's what happens when you are president. It must be difficult. You it lose difficult. your you lose your private life. Yes, totally. You absolutely lose it. Totally. And you, how do you manage? How do you juggle the two, being a private person and being a president? Well, you really have to try and develop a thick skin. A lot of things are thrown at you. You can't afford to to be listening to those things. You have to be constantly focusing on what you think is important. You will have to have the courage of your convictions uh, and be strong, but allow for the possibility that you might be wrong. So you have to have an open mind. You are juggling because... This has always been your approach. You have right? got to be balancing. What you think is important, you should remain fact focused on it, even if it is unpopular. But as I say, listen as much as you can and respond uh, in a measured way. You can't afford to lose uh, your temper. You, you can't afford to be vindictive, even against unfair criticism. Because, you know, there will be criticism, some of it will be legitimate, some of it will be frivolous and malicious. Uh, and you sometimes can't help getting annoyed, but you can't allow yourself to let the anger get the better of you. And therefore, the best thing is to ignore most of, of what you, you consider un unfair criticism. But as I say, listen only to the extent that you want to see. Could, it, could I have done better? Could it have been done better? What are they saying? Even if they are criticizing out of malice, you can still ask them, yes, what do you think, if this, you think, if this is not the best way of doing it, what do you think could have been done? Well, how could it be done better? Because they might have a good idea. In many cases, they wouldn't, but in some cases, they might. And so that's why I say it is very difficult because first you must have the focus, what you want to do, what you want to achieve. You must have your priorities and have the determination, but also the courage of, of, of your convictions to do certain things even if they are unpopular. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you will have to be cognizant of the fact that you are not uh, omniscient, you are not God. You may be making a mistake. And as I say, the thing that you can't afford is to, to be vindictive and beginning hating other people. No, because that's you've that got enough. a job to you've do. Got, you've got a job to do. Let's talk about the HIV. Let's go back to the HIV, H, yeah. HIV problem. You must have been following the challenges of stockouts in Ghana for antiretrovirals where sometimes we have to depend on the benevolence of organizations like USAID to provide our country emergency supplies of antiretrovirals. 
Are ARVs still free in Botswana? Yes. Yes. It's, uh, in the long run, I don't think it's sustainable. But for the time being, yes. So they, how long has it been sustained? still free. How long has it been sustained? Since about 2001, 2002. And you're hoping to it's go almost, about 10 uh, more years? 10 years. I don't know how, lo how far we have to go. We have to start engaging the people now. In fact, we are beginning to do that. The president, the government of the day, is beginning to make noises to that. Your effect. country is also offering free education. That's we cannot that. afford to treat our, ourselves out of the epidemic. So there are new programs, prevention programs. And it's when you are discussing prevention programs that you explain that the present treatment and care is not sustainable in the long run, however much we would like to. We can no longer afford it. The resources at our disposal, the resources at our disposal are diminishing. Because in any case, the population has grown uh, and the costs of uh, all, everything else have gone up. It's rising. Uh, and therefore, uh, we can't. In education, for instance, we have had to adjust. We used to have free education from standard one to PhD. What we did and, and what I had to do was to adjust and say, okay, you know what is going to happen? We can't afford it anymore because of the AIDS uh, p pandemic. The first 12 years of education will continue to be free. We guarantee that. For tertiary education, that is university education, those people who will be doing science subjects will continue to have free education. Those who are doing other subjects will get interest-free loans. So that, that's, that's the situation. We, that's the situation. The idea was to ensure that nobody who could go to university academically is unable to go to university because he will say, I have no man. He will get an interest-free loan. Right, you're watching PM Express, and I am with His Excellency Festus Mugai, the former president of Botswana. We'll take a break, and when we return, we'll explore more of the example of Botswana's support for free education. Botswana. So, sir, we were talking about education. If you have followed the polit political terrain in Ghana now as we go to elections, there are the, the, the contentious issue is one opposition uh, party promising to offer free education at all levels. And then the ruling government says, this is not sustainable. And that there are other problems of education. And the main problem of education is access. So that government is promising to improve access, to make education progressively free. Does this look like the situation in Botswana when you were president? Well, when I was president, we already had made education free. And we had tried to improve access. For instance, so in your, the 80s... It was free. Then you were improving access as well. Yes. In the, in the, in the 80s, uh, we were building 22 junior secondary schools uh, annually, improving the percentage, the, the number of, I agree you, you divide education into three sectors, primary, secondary, secondary and tertiary. tertiary. And you have what they call the, I forget the term they use, the number of children who graduate from primary who then go on to secondary. And those who pass, who graduate from secondary, who go on to University, university, and and so we wanted to ensure the target was that everybody who passes a primary school must be able to go to secondary. It, it was not enough that it is free; you also had to provide the facilities, especially in in the bigger towns. It's easier. Uh, the contractors are here; you can build and, and so on. It's in the rural areas in the remote areas of the country. 
where it's a much bigger challenge. It's much more costly to build two classrooms or five classrooms. It's much more difficult to send teachers uh, to those. You have to do a provide accommodation. And before you are able to do that, uh, the teachers li will live in suboptimal uh, accommodation. Hey, they won't like it. They don't want to be transferred in there. They'll give one excuse uh, or after, uh, another. So uh, access to education is a broader term because it means both they are, they are being able to afford through government the, the fees and the books and but also in all the desks and the classrooms and the availability of teachers. So that's why it is a, a bigger challenge. And then there is, of course, the question of quality. So we, we were training both the teachers, uh, retraining some, upgrading some of the teachers, and training more teachers, building more schools. In the 70s, we used to be allowed to recruit secondary schools teachers from here. I think we did that for from either... From Ghana, you from mean? From Ghana. Yeah. We did that for over a five-year or ten-year period. I can't remember. But uh, then you complained that you were recruiting all your best teachers. Uh, then you stopped the program. But we kept those which we had. They are only coming back now in retirement when they have reached total retirement. And how would you... They went how there, would you, young men and young women, they are coming How would you measure their contribution to the fantastic, education sector fantastic, of your country fantastic. since the 70s till now? Oh, we have the, the African country with one of the highest literacy rates. We have joined you in the literacy rate, uh, around just under 90% literacy. And, and you... You know, I'm interested in you, your country... Um, sustaining a first 12 year free education for citizens your citizens yeah. how is that working so first 12 years that it that means it ends at senior high school right yes. or it ends before senior high school senior high school it, it, you, so it, you, yeah. you for example i'm a Botswana and i'm born in that country i get my basic education all free yes until i finish senior high school yes then at the point of going to university That's then right. i i qualify for subsidized loans loans that to, is an interest-free loan or if you want to be a doctor and an engineer or a physicist then free still so there are specialist areas which government still continues for free. The sciences. So it the is sciences. possible for Ghana I to did, also for have instance, a similar system. I told system. you, I told you that some of the things failed. It, as part some of them of, failed. Yeah. As part of the, no, I say some of the things that I tried to do that failed. I failed. I tried to reorient the education system towards science and technology, also. So I, I, uh, we tried. I uh, suggested that we pay. 10% uh, of salary, science and mathematics allowance. But since the majority of Botswana teachers were not science teachers, they organized a, a strike, a long, long strike, until I gave up, because then it was hurting the very progress I was trying to achieve. And so uh, the incentive that I, pro I tried to provide for people to study science subjects and also teach science subjects was defeated. I cannot imagine an African leader being that modest to accept that he failed in some of his efforts to bring development and improvement to his people. Are you worried that perhaps you're being too modest in your acceptance that there are uh, parts of the, the plan and programs you had which failed? <laughs> if they fail so dramatically, how can you even begin to hide it? Because the thing, the idea of, of uh, paying a 10% science, science bonus or science allowance was a, a publicly announced thing. The intention to do it was publicly announced. And we negotiated it with the teachers to explain the rationale, but they didn't accept it. In the end, they, they responded by, by way you on strike because they alleged they were being told that they are no good, only the teachers who are teaching science are good. In that case, they withdraw their services. 
and so we said, okay, we ag we agreed not not to pay it. But so is it? Uh, it does mean that uh, the incentive that one would had hoped to create uh, was thereby defeated. Are these part of the reasons why you voluntarily left office? Yes, some people say I'm looking younger now than when I was in I was in office. Yes, you you you, you worry about many 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 things. And you take a beating. You age. You develop blood pressure. I compared you to Robert Mugabe when I started my introduction. Um, how do you compare yourself to Robert Mugabe, who is your immediate neighbor, really? He's a strong man. He's a strong man. Are you not as strong as Robert Mugabe? No. Do we not need strong men? No, As African leaders? I thought you, you listened to Obama when he came here. He says Africa needs strong institutions, not strong men. We don't need the type of Mugabe, you would say. We, we need strong institutions, we, which, which are sustainable. We need the rule of law. Leadership, is, uh, political leadership, but any form of leadership is a relay race. You do what you can, you do your best, you run your race, and you hand over the data to the next generation to continue. Would you describe yourself as a fine man for these noble principles? Is it because possibly you lived abroad for too long that you, you, you haven't imbibed some of the African uh, nature in you? I don't know. I think there are many other Africans uh, like me. I think, I think our leaders who led us to independence had a different type of skills as fighters for liberation. I, I think it was erroneous on their part and on our part to assume that they necessarily had the aptitude for governance to develop democracy and development generally. Uh, I think it is increasingly being realized now that governance nowadays, running a government, is about economic management. People expect the jobs from you, uh, health services from you, education, and, and so on. But you have to have appropriate policies, and you work hard, and you take a beating, and so uh, accountable governance means you worry about these people are entitled to demand the things from you. What you have to do is to be able to tell them the truth from time to time. There are certain things which you'd have to do even if they are unpopular. For instance, in my country, at one stage, lots of important people were owing the National Development Bank for farming implements and the things, the tractors, uh, plowshares and so on. And then we had a drought year and before I was minister. Uh, so it was decided that as an emergency drought relief, their loans would be forgiven, written off for that year. After I became vice, vice president and minister of finance and development again, we had another drought. They expected another rental. So I explained that it was not sustainable. We cannot have a situation where farmers borrow and then they don't pay. Uh, second, that's one, it's not sustainable. Secondly, it's unfair. Some people who had plowed and, and, uh, and did not have any crop had not borrowed. They had used their own resources and therefore they don't benefit from a write-off of NDB loans. Thirdly, a third group had borrowed from commercial banks. Our write-offs of NDB, of National Development Bank loans, did not, did not cover those. 
and therefore there was inequity in addition to being unaffordable. Now, uh, you don't become politically popular when you do certain things. When you have colleagues, uh, assets being seized uh, by the bank, they hate you. Uh, but, you know, there are certain things which if you really believe in them, you have to do them, even at the risk of losing your position. You know, in government, sometimes you have to do the right thing and lose your job. Rather than do the wrong thing yes. and, and please stay, the masses and stay yes. in power. Yes. Are you, I'm not saying, are you, are I'm you not religious? Saying, I'm not saying you, you, you defy, you, you challenge everybody to say, no, no, I'm not saying that. But you must be prepared that in the final analysis, you have to compromise. You have to see both sides of a point. Nevertheless, there must be certain minimum uh, points, certain beliefs in which you, you believe strongly, and therefore you have to stick to them. Are you a religious man? No, I, would, I, I believe in God, I'm a Christian, but I'm not, I'm not particularly religious. Welcome back. Right, you're watching PM, PM Express. Express uh, personality we will Friday. My explore guest further into the personality the of the former of Botswana. President. Sir, Botswana before we went on the break, we, we were talking about your personal life. Statement. What kind of a president are you in in the house at home? Are you a president or are you a father? Everybody in their house, they are a father, a husband. But it depends on the kind of your job. If you are a policeman, most of the time when you ought to be at home, you are out on the beat. <laughs> yeah. So the, 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 the job you do impacts on what kind of home life you have. And you, you have three daughters, you, you, yes. you told me. How yes. does it feel having three daughters as an African man? I'm sure you would have loved to have a son who will perhaps inherit you or will succeed you. Yes, I would like to have had uh, a, a son. But if I had sons only, I would have liked to have uh, daughters. So, no, I would have, my, my ideal would have been to have uh, a son and a daughter, or two but, sons and two daughters. But it doesn't happen like that, it's nature. I suppose in the future they can control such things. For now, we have to take what comes our way. And what about your wife, your relationship with your wife as a president? Does she relate to you as a president, his excellency, or just the man she married? It is the man she married. It is the man she married. I'm sure everybody in their private lives, in their homes, they are, they are the individuals that they are. And I, were you possibly expecting anything different? Would you have wished maybe, you know, having come into power, president with all the pecs of presidency, would have loved to the, the be revered the, a little more at home? The presidency kind of interferes with your home life. It's, uh, there are a lot of things you want to do that you can't do because you are, you, you, you are president. But your, your, your family, uh, it's your refuge from from work. I mean, everybody, when they are tired, they want to go back to their, to their homes, their children, their wife. Uh, but being a president interferes with that. Yeah, only in the sense that while you are trying to do things for them, uh, you may be called a boss. People want to see you. Uh, are you disappointed so. you never had a son? No, not too disappointed, no. I have seen people with sons who are worse than useless. It's a question of luck. Either you have a son, he's good, only one, and he's good enough, uh, and you can be very proud of him, and he's proud of you, and you can have 10 sons, and they can all be useless. And therefore, really, that, that is a, a question of luck. You could have daughters, they may be achievers, uh, non-achievers, maybe, maybe, maybe non-achievers. That has nothing to do whether they are sons or or daughters. 
you feel the most important thing is your obligation as a yeah. parent to any child you have, yes. whether male or female. Yes. Have you always... And also that, no, even the more selfish one of wanting your name or your heritage to be carried forward, there is no guarantee that it will be carried forward by your son rather than your daughter. Have you always dreamt about being a president? No, no, no. You never? So being I a never, president came I, by accident? Came by, by oh, yes. By accident? The, 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 you didn't plan it? No. But no. you contested to be a representative of uh, Palpai, right? That's when, uh, your when, constituency. When Palapi, yes. When you go through life, there are opportunities or certain things that happen and cause you to act in, in, a, in a particular way. No, I hadn't planned it to be, to be president. That's what what have you planned to be? That's why I was a civil servant for 23 years. And a, I only became, a good one. I only became, eh, well, an economist and a uh, general administrator. I was a permanent secretary. Uh, in fact, my last job in the public services was secretary to the cabinet for, for, for seven years. Uh, so I only became a, a, a politician when I retired from the public service and friends of mine uh, asked me uh, to join and then I, I agreed. And you were, you, were you happy being a civil servant? Yes, it was And that's what you dreamed a, of a, becoming? No, no. Do you know what? If you keep on saying dreaming, I don't know at what stage. I, I was born from a poor family in a rural area. The most important person I knew was the chief. The next most important was the district commissioner. So uh, when I was at primary school, I dreamt of being a district commissioner. That was a very important man in, in my life. In your life. Yes, but uh, as you grow up, then you know. Your dreams change. Is, this, yes, your aspirations change, your dreams change. I. I even when I was, at, when I passed school certificate, I had not met an economist. When I went to England to do A levels, it was to study the, the English to come and be a teacher. Uh, but then I came across economics and became interested in economics. Uh, and so. Uh, those are the things that happen in, in, in one's life. But as so, you say, when you talk about dreams, it's the people you see as you grow up who you aspire to. So now that you're out of office, I do know that many African leaders, when they're out of office, go into farming. You are a farmer. How active are you no, I'm, involved? I'm not an active farmer. When I retired, the people were generally they gave me lots of livestock. They gave me 250 chickens, two, cha two, two cats, and four donkeys, two dogs, and 200 head of cattle, 100 goats, 20 sheep, lots of retirement chests, lots of walking sticks, uh, and, and things like that. And so, yes, I keep some cattle because I was given. Uh, but I have no, I have some understanding of, of livestock ranching. But you wouldn't say you are an active but, uh, farmer? No. Not, no at all. not you, at all. You haven't been on the farm to weed, for example? No. Never no. in your lifetime? No, in a lifetime. No, I say I was a rural boy. How could, what could you say in my <laughs> lifetime? I grew up as a rural boy. I worked very hard in the fields. I never aspired to, <laughs> to be, to a be farmer. there. No, no way. Whilst you were in office as president, Yes. What is the one thing you miss so much that if you had the opportunity, you will go back to make right? I, I don't know uh, the sense in which you, you mean it. Let me give you an example. I mean, you, you've spent, you spent um, how many years were you in office as president? Ten years. Ten years. And you stepped aside yeah. voluntarily. Yes. Do you miss being in office as president? No, I don't. You don't at all? No. I had had enough. You had enough at yes. the time. You would never would have wished to go back no. and be a president again. No. You no. don't miss anything at all from well, being a president. Well, I suppose I miss uh, having access to a, a helicopter so I can go around 
Yes, I miss that. The helicopter. That's what I miss. Anything else you miss? Anything unique no, no, in your presidency no. that you Well, miss? I made lots of good friends. I, I still make friends easy. I, I'm, I'm able to make friends. So, no, I don't, I don't miss. It's a part of my life. I, I, I don't want to live again. I don't regret it. I think I, I did. I gave it my best shot, and, and that's passed. You also told me that you grew up um, in a rural well, setting yes. uh, from poor well, parents. Yes. Tell me how your upbringing went about siblings and your decision, or whether it was a decision of your parents to go to England, Oxford, to study. No, that <laughs> you don't understand. I don't know here in Ghana, in my country, poor people cannot afford to send their children to any school, let alone to England. So by the time I went to England, it's because I had a, a government bursary to do so. In fact, the only way I got education was that there used to be a system called merit bursaries. If you got first class at standard six, then you could get a government bursary, which covered the school fees and boarding, if, if it was boarding. But you still had to buy your own books and so on. So at Standard 6, I, I got first last, therefore I got a bursary to go to secondary school, to a boarding secondary school. At the end of the boarding secondary school, I, I, I passed well. Again, I got another bursary uh, to go to, um, to university. So I only got my education through getting bursaries. Otherwise, I would not have afforded. And in any case, I used to work. Even uh, at secondary school, I used to work part-time. I used to uh, coach the teacher's children in, in, in some subject. And they would give me 10 shillings. And that, that was useful. Uh, when I was English, uh, an undergraduate, I used to work during school holiday. I mean, during college holidays. So that's all. You are seventy-three. You look very fit. Do you exercise? Yes, yeah, not as much as as, as I should. Yes, I try to. What types of exercises do you well, engage in? Well, mostly walking, and then I also have a I have a gym. I do various things: weightlifting, walking. And you do, you do press exertions, ups so press ups, and so on. Yeah, and how do you feel? I mean, in your body, health wise, do you feel as fit and strong as you look? No, no, I don't. I don't feel that. So gradually, you think the, being a president took too much toll on your health and on your life? Yes, I don't know whether it was being president or. or I am aging anyway. One thing I find that my memory is not as, as sharp as it used to be. I, I tend to forget things. Uh, but I've done many other jobs, even in the civil service, when I was permanent secretary, minister of finance, when I was permanent secretary to the president, and that is cabinet secretary. Those were strenuous jobs, of course, the public sector jobs. Are you a happy man? Yes, I'm a happy man. What makes you happy? I look back and think that uh, I have made some modest contribution to the, the development of my country and to the betterment of the lives of people with whom I came into contact. I wish I could have done more, but uh, I, I think I have done my fair share. Do you have a sense of fashion? How do you dress when you want to go out on a private occasion, what choices do you make in your fashion style? Well, conventional, not conventional. Uh, not, uh, not, uh, when you say conventional, shirt I mean, and tie and suit, is is that what you love? Not always. I mean, I live in a, a hot country, therefore, most of the time we're in open sheds. Uh, but yes, I I I, I like. Uh, wearing the, the clothes, but not too fashionable clothes. I mean, like now I, I wear shoes like this. I don't have shoes like yours. <laughs> <laughs> so it means that whilst you were president, you didn't determine what you will wear? Well, well like if they I, brought you I, something, I, did you choose? I still, I still, 
I still wore the clothes I wore when I was in civil service. I don't see president dress any differently from, from, from other people. I mean, people, fashionable presidents are fashionable presidents because they are the individuals who, who love fashion. And, uh, right, so uh, you came to Ghana to take part in the CDD program on, on governance. Uh, yeah. What would be your advice to public office seekers, people who are seeking the mandate of the people to rule this country or go to parliament? What would be your advice to them? My advice would be that I assume they are seeking public office because they want to achieve certain things and that if that be the case, they have to remain focused and true to their values and to the objectives for coming into public office and that they have to accept that uh, their lives will not longer be, be their own. If you like, if you, you become uh, a, a, a public leader, then you become owned by the people because you become uh, accountable to them for things that you would otherwise not be accountable to them. I remember one time we were I, uh, arguing with, uh, discussing the, the salaries of, of, of elected uh, officials in, in my country and I was explaining the difference between members of parliament and members of parliament are accountable to their constituents and of course their party and so on but above all to their constituents. In our case ministers have to be appointed from among members of parliament so I said that in the case of ministers they remain accountable to their constituents in order to get elected but they then become accountable to the rest of the nation for the sector for which they are responsible. If he's Minister of Agriculture, he then becomes accountable to all the farmers in the country. Uh, that that uh, 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 a responsibility. Uh, so you, all, you don't do only what you yourself want to do. You have to do what the people want. So. Botswana has a very, uh, very successful democratic system. How do you compare that to Ghana's? Ghana is a successful democratic system. The only difference is that at some stage in the past you, you had a, a, a turbulent changes and so on, but the situation has stabilized, you have outgrown that, and you, are, you have a democratic dispensation. As for democracy, democracy is not an event. It's a perpetual work in progress. You go on in, in improving and changing and adapting to changing circumstances. The United States is a, a, a democracy, but see how many constitutional changes that they have had. That means that you never finish being a, a democratic. You keep on trying to refine, and challenges arise that for which you have not made provision and therefore, you try to, to, to adapt that. And so, also, uh, we must be aware that we are talking in relative terms. When we say successful, I would say yes, I suppose. We are, relative, we are relatively successful. We never have officially, officially one-party state. We never had the political prisoners. We never have had detentions. Uh, so to 